Two days ago, on April 5th, ESPN staff writers ranked their top 10 head coaches entering 2024 and averaged out their rankings into a singular ESPN ranking of the top 10 coaches in college football entering the 2024 season. Kirby Smart was unanimously at number one. I don't think anyone disagrees about that, with Nick Saban retiring. And even if Jim Harbaugh were to return at Michigan, Smart has a head-to-head victory over him, recruits better, develops better, and he has more national titles. So end of discussion there, and Jim Harbaugh's off to the NFL. But after Kirby Smart, there was an interesting case study. Kalen DeBoer at Alabama was number two on average. Kyle Whittingham was number three from Utah. I respect that ranking. Dabo Swinney from Clemson was fourth. Mike Norvell at Florida State enters at five. Dan Lanning from Oregon is at six. Steve Sarkeesian from Texas is at seventh. Lane Kiffin of Ole Miss is eighth. Lance Leopold of Kansas at nine. Respect on his name. And Ryan Day was all the way down at ten. And some people left him out of their top 10. And that is a travesty. That is asinine. That is an atrocity. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Clearly, ESPN has been drinking or smoking something that is illegal. Because having Ryan Day out of your top 10 in the cases of some writers and at an average place of 10 behind less experienced and less proven coaches coaches who don't develop as well, don't recruit as well, or don't coach as well in-game, this is just an objectively bad list for the sole fact that Ryan Day is at 10, along with some other issues. That's what we're going to be talking about today on College Football with Sam, and there are other channels who've covered this video. As per usual, I am late to the party because I wanted to dive in, really think about this, not just do an instant type of reaction, but Um, Uncle Lou did a video on this, Trojan Blade did a video on this from different angles and perspectives, and I'm going to link their videos in the description and in the pinned comment. I encourage you to check them out. Uncle Lou's video in particular was rather humus and also insightful. He does a good job of combining humor and insight in his content. But without further ado, let's dive in, and before we do that, hit the like button, Subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell so that you can get notified when I release more college football content, Big Ten football content, and football content that relates to the Ohio State Buckeyes. This is the best Big Ten football channel on YouTube. We're trying to make it the best college football channel on YouTube, but I always like to keep a Big Ten perspective on things, and especially being a Michigan fan who also has a high amount of respect for Ohio State. I do cover the Wolverines and the Buckeyes and the game, the rivalry, very often. Many of you who are subscribed obviously know that, but just for those of you who may be new, I just wanted to put that out there. Comment your top 10 coaches for college football entering the 2024 season down below, and share this video around if you enjoy it, and I'm pretty sure you will. And thank you to my patrons for sponsoring this channel and this video. I'm going to shout out your name at the end of the video. If you want to go the extra mile and support the channel and what we do here on College Football with Sam, you can check out my Patreon page or my merchandise store via the links in the description and in the pinned comment at the top of the comment section. Thank you all for the support, and let's dive a little deeper and talk about some more issues that I have with this list, along with getting more into the weeds of why I think that Day being ranked so low is, it's gross. Um, Anyway, first and foremost, I think that the issue with this list is that there's no criteria. The writers could use any criteria that they wanted, and because we all have different perspectives and some like numbers and and power rankings, Bill Connolly participated in this list, for example, and depressingly enough, he was one of the writers who had Day out of his top 10, which I just think doesn't make any sense, but... It is what it is. Others, like all-time record. These are the people who ranked Jimbo Fisher in the top 10 entering last year. Um, I think that is probably the most ridiculous position. These are the people that also rank Mac Brown very, very high. And likely the reason why Dabo Swinney is at number four, despite the fact that he's underachieved now for 
four years in a row. His 2020 team, yes, made the college football playoff and had Trevor Lawrence not caught COVID, or if his sickness was handled differently, yes, they probably beat Notre Dame in the regular season. But that Ohio State game was no fluke. Ohio State destroys that team six or seven times out of ten, probably beats them nine or closer to ten times out of ten. And with Trevor Lawrence and the amount of production players they had returning, that was inexcusable. But it is what it is, and that Alabama team in 2020 was ridiculously good. So was Ohio State, who got blown out by Alabama, but that's how elite 2020 Alabama was. Not to get too sidetracked, though, their criteria was very loose, and you don't want to have completely rigid criteria. You want to let the writers share their different perspectives, their diverse viewpoints. But having no rules at all and no boundaries just makes this list confusing. And it's, it's why you have Deion Sanders in the received votes category, despite the fact that his record in college football, in FBS only, is 4-8. and eight. And the fact that, well, I like Deion Sanders. I like the fact that he is very blunt, that he doesn't care what people have to say, that he just does what he does, and that I think he also cares about his players and genuinely wants what's best for them. His game day coaching has not been good so far, and we only have one year of sample size. Sanders comes across to me as a coach that will more so have to rely on his staff to have success in the FBS rather than being a genius who's a a puppet master of his entire staff. Like, let's say Nick Saban, who it didn't matter who Nick Saban had on staff. Last year was, in my opinion, not a good staff for Alabama. Tommy Reese and Kevin Steele were not good coordinators, in my opinion. And yet, Alabama went 12-2. and They squeezed out wins. They found a way to beat Georgia. They nearly beat Michigan. Those are the top two teams in terms of power rankings last year, according to FPI. There are different styles of coaching, different types of coaches, but even if you really think that Deion Sanders is the next best coach in college football, there he should be nowhere near the top 10. And speculative rankings have their place, but I think they should be in a different category. I, I really do. I think that's the biggest problem, in fact, with this list first and foremost, is what's the criteria? Do we care about wins in general? Do we only care about top 10 wins, college football playoff wins, wins against top five teams, top 10 teams, top 25? Do we care about recruiting? Do we care more about development? So do we prefer the Kyle Whittinghams, the Kirk Ferences, the Paul Christs, Lance Leipolds and Chris Kleimans of the world who don't recruit in the top 25, but they developed and often overachieved given their talent roster? R.I.P. to Paul Christ at Wisconsin, that kind of fell apart. Or do we rely on the Mario Cristobals, the Nick Sabans, Kirby Smarts, though Nick Saban and Kirby Smart also fall into the former category. They're, they're elite in development, game day coaching, and recruiting. Like three key pillars, and that's actually something I should do is come up with pillars as to what I think makes an elite head coach. But you get the point with Mario Cristobal. Heck, add Tom Herman up there who recruited, didn't recruit as well as Sark did at Texas, but recruited rather well. Lincoln Riley and some of these other coaches. Oh, Will Muschamp. Will Muschamp fits in with Mario Cristobal. Elite recruiters just can't coach in-game to save their life. Can't do it. Like, what do we value most here? What does ESPN value most here? I I can't exactly place it. It seems like... It's a combination of all-time wins, it's a combination of speculation, combination of narrative, because, for example, Ryan Day has performed better than Dan Lanning by a mile in big games, and they both recruit at a similar level. Oregon, in fact, finished with a higher recruiting class than Ohio State did for the 2024 cycle. Mike Norvell seems to be very speculative. Mike Norvell beat an LSU team who was in the top 10, but turned out to be probably more of a top 15 team that was very offensively minded and had absolutely no defense. They basically beat a Lincoln Riley Oklahoma team and didn't get another big win last year. You can count Clemson as a big win. I think that's appropriate. But in terms of an objective big win, beating 
a great team. Didn't do it. Same thing in 22, 21, and 20 in Norvell's first year. Steve Sarkeesian beat Alabama on the road. That's very impressive. One problem. That Alabama team is the worst Nick Saban team since maybe his first year at Alabama or, at best, 2008. And nearly lost to TCU, struggled against Kansas State. I mean, they nearly choked several games throughout the season. Lost to Oklahoma, who was straight up overrated, and Washington could have blown them off the field if they didn't let the foot off the gas. That's, that season that I just described hasn't happened to Ryan Day. It hasn't. But before we get into that, how is Sweeney in the top 10 still? Unless you're talking about all-time wins, all-time titles, because in the past three, four years, which with the transfer portal, with players who are good enough to play at the next level, often leaving early for the NFL, whether it's a year or two years, or in the case of Marvin Harrison Jr., and some other players, like two or three years, if they had an extra COVID year, leaving that much eligibility on the table, your roster timeline, like where your recruiting class still exists in a close to original form before they graduate or before most of them are gone, is probably three or four years. And we've crossed that point. So we've cycled through the last very relevant Clemson recruiting class that has contributed to their team. And they've won nothing. Blown out by Ohio State in 2020, lost to an overrated Notre Dame team that had no business being in the playoffs that year. In 2021, they disappointed. The offense was trash. Same thing in 22. Same thing last year. The defense, it it has not been the same since Venables left. It's still very good. It's great. It's near elite. It's lost its elite edge that it had when Brent Venables was there. Clemson is regressing. It's clear. In the past four seasons, their best year was 2020. Their worst year was 2023. 2021 versus 2022, I don't know which of those teams were better. They they were pretty darn similar. And in the spring game, they didn't look too good in the spring game. Defense clearly dominated. It is early, but... They're clearly regressing, and until proven otherwise, I can't pick them to be an elite program. And they're no longer recruiting inside the top 10. And there's just a a plethora of issues with Clemson right now and with Dabo Swinney. And they still have not used the transfer portal. They've offered players out of the portal. Very few, a handful of them. They have not received any transfer portal commits, and they have to do that this spring in order for anyone to view them in light of an elite program, elite team, with an elite head coach. I liked the staff hires they made, but we'll see if Lincoln Riley's brother, Garrett Riley, we'll see what he can do with the offense this year. We have questions. I have questions. Getting on to Ryan Day, finally. He is a better game day coach than more than half of these coaches on this list, in my opinion. Better than Sweeney, better than Norvell, Lanning, Sark, Kiffin. That's half of them right there. Leipold, I think, is an absolute genius, but he doesn't have the recruiting prowess that Day does, and Kansas is almost the opposite situation of Ohio State. Leipold, for all intents and purposes, is actually in my top 10 rankings that I'll show you here in a few minutes. But having Day at 10 is, it's terrible. It's objectively a terrible ranking. He has more wins against better opponents in a tougher conference than Lanning or Sark have coached in. And Kiffin, at this point, Lane Kiffin's best win at Ole Miss is against Penn State this year, against a gutted Penn State in in the Peach Bowl. That's his best win. Now, he has done more with less. Ole Miss is a harder job than Ohio State. Make no mistake about that. And I think Kiffin actually proved me wrong in what he did this past season, going 11-2, and beating Penn State when I thought that Penn State had a, a good shot of destroying Ole Miss in that Peach Bowl game. And I respect that. But to put him above Ryan Day, seriously? Seriously? There's just, 
there's there's so much wrong with that. And Sweeney at four is, in a certain sense, the icing on the cake or the cherry on top of why this list, I, I, I just don't like it. Even Mike Norvell at five. 13-1 and one this year was impressive, and I think on a strength of record basis, which is how the college football playoff ranking should operate, they did get snubbed from the playoff. But Ohio State this year was better than Florida State this year, even if FSU was healthy. It's been that way since Norvell got to Florida State. Now, he had to build it up again, but he hasn't won the games that Day has won. He's not recruited or developed at that level, and... He's played in a weaker conference than Day has to almost offset the fact that he inherited a worse situation. I want to show you my top 10 college football coaches entering the 2024 season. This is just my opinion. I can give you my criteria in in a general sense. At least I have more criteria than this ESPN ranking does, but it's not uber detailed or very rigid either. There is some flexibility, some speculation and other things tied to this list. I agree, actually, with ESPN's top three here. Um, I love coaches that do more with less, or that at least develop at a high level, even if they do recruit well. I have Kirby Smart at one. I don't think there's any disputing that he's the best coach in the country. That could change this year. That could, depending on which team wins the national championship, or if certain teams are dominant while winning the national championship. That could change. I think there is room for that to change, and I think that might be a bold opinion of mine. But right now, he's the undisputed number one. He's the number one coach at the number one program in the country. And that's why, as I've stated in my Georgia video, which you all should watch, I'm right now leaning toward picking Georgia to win it all. And in my early college football playoff predictions video, I picked them to win it all. I have Kalen DeBoer at number two from Alabama. DeBoer has won everywhere he's been at, whether it's at the FBS level or lower. He is an offensive mastermind. His teams are disciplined. His teams believe in him. And he's very adaptive. And I've watched him coach circles around Dan Lanning three times. I watched him embarrass Texas, who had an infinitely more talented roster than his Washington Huskies in the Sugar Bowl. I watched them fight with a Michigan team that was many touchdowns superior to them, and they fought for more than three quarters, despite Michigan controlling the game. It was an admirable effort. And I've watched them take apart it's not extremely impressive, but the Michigan State Spartans, it's coming from a Big Ten perspective, for two seasons in a row. And their wins against whether it's Oregon State, whether it's Oregon, whether it's USC, they, they played a tough schedule last season in a, a Pac-12 conference that might have been the deepest conference in the country. I mean, there's a reason they smoked Texas, or nearly Smoke Texas. Texas did end up nearly coming back and winning that game. They were better than Texas. They were better than Alabama. They were better than many teams in the SEC. You could you could say the same even about Oregon, potentially, even though they didn't get a chance to prove that in the playoffs. He's an elite head coach. They're recruiting well at Alabama right now, and he's a proven developer, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Kyle Whittingham at three, similar in DeBoer or with DeBoer in terms of development. He's been at Utah forever, and he knows how to coach. Defense is always sound. They're a program that is as tough as nails, and he's a great schemer who knows how to build the staff and nurture an elite culture. I have Day at number four. Day is, I think he's at a point that Kirby Smart was at in between 2019 2020 and 2021, where he just needs to break through. He just needs to get over the hump. He's already maxed out at the current level that he's at. He has won playoff games, a playoff game against Clemson in 2020. The majority of his losses are to teams who participated in the college football playoff. He has only won the Big Ten twice in his five seasons. And some people will say that Urban just ran the program differently at Ohio State. But I will tell you that 
None of Urban Meyer's teams outside of maybe the 2014 team at the end of the season would have beaten 2022 or 2023 Michigan, and many of them would have lost to 2021 Michigan, whether those games were played in Columbus, Neutral Field, or Ann Arbor. My, my, my statement will stand, and I will fight for that statement. He has faced an elite Michigan program. He has faced a Big Ten that, on average, has probably gotten weaker, but Penn State's recruited at a better level. Michigan's recruited and developed at a better level. And he's had to make tough changes, and he's had to, in a certain way, learn how to be a CEO and a head coach on the job. He's had to fight the transfer portal. He's had to adapt to NIL. And by fight the portal, I mean adapt to it, but also try and retain his players. Ohio State didn't start out as a top-end NIL program, and I guarantee you there were schools trying to poach some Ohio State players away. And he had to fight for his school to pay his players as well, advocating and doing fundraising. He's a great coach. He's a coach, I think, with a conscience and good character. And now some would say that doesn't matter a lot in terms of winning games and such, but I I think that there's admiration in that. And with Jim Harbaugh and Nick Saban retiring, that shifts him up a few spots. Those were some of the few head coaches that were objectively better than Ryan Day, and they're gone from the sport and days left. So I have him at number four. I think last year I had him, I think, yeah, last year I had him at fifth. So overall, he really fell one spot, you know, raised two because of the retirements, but then falling back down because I think Kalen DeBoer passed him last season. But that that is just my opinion. That's the top four. I'm, I'm rambling on and, and taking a little long to explain But Jonathan Smith at five, I love what he's done at Oregon State. Solid trench play. Very much like Whittingham in doing more with less, except Oregon State never had a roster that was top 50 in talent. They won 10 games in 2022, seven in 2021, and eight last season. And they had a murderer's row of a schedule last year. They beat Utah. They competed with Washington. They competed with Arizona. And they had a lot of close games, but they also had games in which they were dominant and other games where they played close with opponents that probably should have beat them by more. But Smith is a, he's he's objectively a genius, helping to rebuild Oregon State and Michigan State has a much bigger talent pool, recruiting footprint, and more resources than Oregon State could dream of. And I think that he is going to be very successful there. And even if I had different thoughts and had more questions about his success potentially at Michigan State, his resume speaks for himself. Not many coaches can build Oregon State in that way, and it's it's different than the Mike Riley teams. I think that Jonathan Smith is a different coach than Mike Riley. Riley, of course, flamed out at Nebraska. Smith, the trajectory has been upward. The potential has been increasing every year at Oregon State. It is a constant upward climb, and a climb that Jonathan Smith has made. I have Brian Kelly at six for LSU. We'll see how the new defensive staff works out, but Kelly's a proven winner at Notre Dame. And he came in to the SEC West in its first season, second to last season, mind you, and he beat Alabama, and he played in the SEC championship game. And that is a mark of a good coach to come into a team that was disorganized and poorly coached the prior season and get them to 10 wins and get them to compete for an SEC championship. That's impressive. Lance Leopold, I love what he's done at Kansas. Andy Kotelnicki leaves for Penn State, but they return a hefty amount of their offensive production and starters, and they've exceeded expectations for two years in a row now. They finished ranked last year, Kansas did. Kansas, I think, has a bright future in the Big 12, And based off of Leipold's success at Kansas, his success at Buffalo, and his success at Wisconsin-Whitewater, I think it's appropriate to put him in the top 10. Dan Lanning is a coach that I am very high on. He has not beaten anyone of note yet. He beat Texas Tech last season, beat USC. Last year, he beat Utah. He beat Liberty in the bowl game. And the prior season, he beat a BYU team that at the time was ranked, and he, he's, he's picked up some 
good wins, but for the most part, every great team or great coach that he's faced up against, look at Georgia in 22, Washington and Oregon State the same year, look at Washington this season, they control him. And they they coach circles around him and around his team, who the only team that Oregon has played that has been more talented than them under Dan Lanning in terms of recruiting rankings has been Georgia. So some could also argue that Lanning walked into a good situation, and we still have no idea how good of a coach he is. Now, I think that's extreme. I think there's an argument for it. But he's recruited well. He's done extremely well in the transfer portal. And he's hired a great staff. So I think the question for Lanning is, is is he a, a James Franklin where, you know, he's a good coach, maybe great, but not near elite and certainly not elite? Or is he like a Kirby Smart, like his mentor, like his former head coach when he was the defensive coordinator at Georgia, where he can be that elite coach and he just needs to learn how to do that? We'll see. I think Landing is closer to the latter than the former. Chris Kleiman, very similar to Leipold and very similar to Kalen DeBoer in terms of their history with lower-level programs and their success and doing more with less at programs that they've coached at in terms of DeBoer, who's now the head coach of an elite Blue Blood caliber program, and Kleiman, who's still at Kansas State, but they won the Big 12 just two years ago. And they could very easily win it again this upcoming season. And at 10, I have Luke Fickle. I think a lot of people are selling on Luke Fickle after last year's debut at Wisconsin, where he went 7-6. and six. There were some injuries. There were also some just bizarre things from a Fickle team, uh, a defense that at times looked fickle, a pun intended there and an offense that just came out flat, which not everyone, but some, expected from... I'm blanking on the offensive coordinator's name for Wisconsin. That's a shame. Um, air, But they, they came in with, with the air raid, and they brought in Tanner Mordecai, and I at least expected more from Wisconsin last season. Um the offensive coordinator for Wisconsin is Phil Longo. I, I can't believe I forgot that. But I've been working hard, and I main, I was mainly here to talk about this list and also about Ryan Day. But Luke Fickle at 10, I think it's a mistake to sell his stock. Reached the college football playoff with Cincinnati in 21, had an elite season with the Bearcats in 2020. And Wisconsin, Paul Christ was beginning to drive them into the dirt. And I think Fickle's first year was him regaining cabin pressure and gaining control of the team and getting just building his culture his staff and I'm excited to see what the future of Wisconsin looks like under Fickle in the future but I think right now given his past resume again doing more with less I think he deserves to be at least in the conversation of the top 10 I don't have Norvell or Sweeney in the top 10 I want to see more from Norvell in fact I Part of me expects him by this time next season to be in my top 10 of these rankings. Swinney, I'm totally selling on at least right now. Sarkeesian, I think Sarkeesian is a lot like Lincoln Riley. And and, and I am I genuinely have that opinion. I'm, I'm very curious to see how Texas will do in the SEC. I think he's a genius offensive coordinator, although now being a head coach, he's made some horrific offensive game plans. Uh, the red zone issues, not scoring enough points against defenses that are lackluster in terms of talent comparison to Texas's offense, etc. I don't think he belongs anywhere near the top 10, let alone the top 15. Great season at Texas last year, and he's built a good staff and he's recruiting at an elite level, but how does he do against elite teams? And just just be careful. Be careful with Sarkeesian in my mind. And Lane Kiffin, if Ole Miss does well this season, if if they improve off of last season, which some regard as the greatest season in Ole Miss history, and maybe they reach the SEC championship game, go on a run in the playoff, or they win the SEC, maybe he is top 10. But right now, I need to see him beat a great team. 
an elite team. So that's my list. If you disagree, which I imagine many of you are going to disagree, let me know down below the criteria for my list. I probably should have went more in detail with this earlier, but I have one. It's, it's, it's basically success over the past three seasons. I really don't like to count COVID. I did more so last year because I wanted a bigger sample size, but it's, it focuses on success over the past three seasons. If the coaches have coached for longer than that, I, I might extend it out a little bit, and I like to focus on how good the teams have looked on paper and power rankings, how they have done in the games that matter the most in the regular season and postseason, which not many coaches right now outside of Kirby Smart actually have a, a resume above a 500 in those games, at least with a large sample size. And... What, what does their future look like? There's a little bit of speculation in those rankings too, but it's mainly heavy recency bias in terms of success in games that matter, adjusting for, I would say, strength of schedule, strength of record, etc. Ryan Day is a top five head coach. And if Ohio State kept that double digit lead against Georgia in the Peach Bowl, won it by double digits, which they could have, and they beat TCU in the national championship, even if... Last year's season happened exactly as it did, and Ryan Day still had a three-game losing streak to Michigan, but he had that national championship under his belt, and he beat Kirby Smart and beat him handily, and then he beat TCU in that game. That would give him one less loss and two extra wins. That'd be a 58-7 and record. I might have him at number two or, heck, maybe even number one. I mean, I mean that that margin is so, so small. It, it, I mean, there's, in my mind, you could say that Ryan Day is the, the second best head coach in the country. You could. He's certainly in the top five. Three of the eight losses that he has suffered are to college football playoff champions, 2020 Alabama, which could be the greatest team of all time, 2022 Georgia, a 15-0 and team, a dominant team, and 2023 Michigan, exactly like Georgia, 15-0, and dominant team. Those teams were experts in game control, in choking out opponents. And Day played both of those teams close in, in essentially road environments. The, the, the Peach Bowl in 2022 played in Atlanta, essentially, that, that, that's basically a road environment. And then... 2023 Michigan, the game played in Ann Arbor. Again, I mean, that that is actually a road environment there. And 2020 Alabama, there weren't very many, if any, fans in the stands, pure neutral site. And he's played in a, the Big Ten, which is the second best conference to the SEC. And last season, I would argue that the bowl games, you, you can't take a ton from them, but you can take some of it some from them. I'd argue the Big Ten's top three teams were better than the SEC's top three teams last season. That was one of the first seasons where the Big Ten's higher level of teams, I think, were better than the SEC's higher level of teams. And maybe you could say the same in 2022, but with Georgia winning it all and objectively being better than Ohio State and Michigan, I'd, ha I'd have a hard time with that. Day has played a Michigan program that Urban never had to face. He has still had to face Penn State, who we know James Franklin. He has issues in big games, but he, he still f operates right now, a team that consistently places in the top 10, top 15. Ohio State's played out of conference foes in Oregon, Notre Dame. And when they reach the college football playoff, like in 2019, 20, and 22, in all of those games, I mean, they, they played they played elite teams. They did. There were no Cincinnati's or TCU's that they faced. There was no 2023 Alabama even, or 2023 Texas, or even 2023 Washington that they played. They, they played better opponents, elite opponents. Six of Day's eight losses are to college football playoff participants in whole. Those are 2019 Clemson, 2020 Alabama, 2021 Michigan, 2022 Michigan and Georgia, 
and 2023 Michigan. He has a Michigan problem, but how is that any different from Kirby Smart having an Alabama problem? Uh, The answer to your question is, it isn't. Another funny thing is, Georgia's second toughest rival is Auburn. Kirby Smart owns Auburn in the same way that Ryan Day owns Penn State, who's the second closest rival to Ohio State, though obviously far, far away from Ohio State's rivalry with Michigan. And I know Ohio State fans, rightfully so, are frustrated with this 1-3 and record against Michigan. But think of it this way. Just think about this. Elite coaches are still human beings. They're still not perfect. Demanding perfection in any profession is a recipe for disaster. If 2020 was a normal year, Ohio State probably goes 14-1, and losing to Alabama still. They beat Michigan. They win all their non-conference games. Ryan Day is a 2-3 and three record against Michigan. He has an additional 7 wins, so a 63-8 and eight record at worst. You flip a coin and the field goal by Ruggles goes through in the Peach Bowl. Ohio State wins it all. Or Marvin Harrison Jr. doesn't get injured. Or, you know... You can change just little things in Ohio State's past, and day is viewed totally differently. Now, he has to beat Michigan at some point, whether that's once this year, whether that's maybe twice, or heck, they can meet even three times this year. Maybe he beats Michigan all three of those games and all of a sudden has a winning record against Michigan again. Or maybe he goes 1-1 one and one against Michigan, or 2-1, and one, or 1-2, one and two, or my goodness, 0-3. Oh we don't know what this season holds yet. But Day reminds me a lot, a ton, of Kirby Smart at Georgia before he went on his national championship run and his 42-2 run that he has had since 2021. It's extremely impressive. Smart was 52-14 at Georgia in his first five seasons. Recruited an elite level, developed at an elite level, had some questionable coaching on the field and off the field decisions like Deus had and smart learned from it. And now he's at the top of college football. He's at Mount Everest, the peak of Mount Everest. And I think day hiring Jim Knowles is very similar to smart hiring Todd Monken, where you're, 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 you're pivoting a little bit and it's for the better. Now there are things that day has to work on. The offense has to get back to his style of offense And hopefully Chip Kelly can help Ryan Day put his offense, the offenses that we knew from 19 to 2022, what we expect from a Ryan Day offense on the field with a little bit of Chip Kelly flavor. The defense has to stay elite. Ohio State's strength and conditioning, I still think, needs to be observed under the microscope. And I think more changes than what have been made need to be made. But Day is far from a bad coach. He's just an elite head coach or maybe a near-elite head coach that is still figuring out how to control and how to win in an elite conference against the best of the best. And with Jim Harbaugh leaving Michigan and the Wolverines losing the production that they are, there's a window. There's a massive window of opportunity, even with Ohio State's tough schedule, to come out and win the Big Ten this year and win it all this year. Day's a top-five head coach. To have anyone ranking him outside of the top 10, to have someone rank him below the likes of Steve Sarkeesian, Lane Kiffin, Dan Lanning, who's only been at Oregon for two years and has played on average in an easier conference, below Mike Norvell, below Dabo Swinney, who Day has a head-to-head win against. He's one and one against Dabo Swinney, and he is adapted to the current era of college football better. He plays in a tougher conference. Day does. He coaches. And... Ohio State right now is just objectively miles better than Clemson. So I don't get ESPN's rankings. I think it is a trash top 10. I think many other people's, including my own's top 10 rankings are better. And I think Day objectively is one of the five best head coaches in college football right now. Thank you all so much for watching this video. And please remember to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell and comment your own top 10 college football head coaches entering this coming season down below. 
Thank you so much to Crash2488 for sponsoring this channel and video as a Heisman member. Thanks to Spencer Bringhurst, Chris Lane, and SFS Inverted for sponsoring this video as an All-American member. Thanks to Will Loftus, John Lynn, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Austin Christmas, and Janisha Cockrell for sponsoring this channel as all conference members. Have a great day, guys. This video was so much longer than I originally intended it to be. I wanted it to be 30 minutes long, and it's 40 minutes long, but I had fun doing this. It was, it was fun reacting to something for the first time in a while. Have a great day, guys, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.